they had a really interesting conversation. The workshop itself ended up being much more focused on plastics and paper recycling, um, but they had a really interesting conversation about using, um, reusing plastic as opposed to actually transforming it into something new. And so we're hoping that that definition dif difference might end up applying to what we do. Next slide. So I just wanted to read one highlight uh, from the JVC comments, um, talking about like why the jewelry industry should get to benefit from uh, all of this environmental terminology. So the inherent value of the products used in the jewelry industry means that almost all of the component parts used to make fine jewelry are reused in the jewelry life cycle. Fine jewelry components, including gemstones and precious metal, are holders of wealth and sometimes treated as commodities. There are thousands of years of tradition of reusing, recycling, and passing down jewelry through generations. Rarely does this material get discarded. Precious metals and gemstones will be refined, recut, and reused over and over again. The continued popularity of estate jewelry alone as its own market indicates the value in reusing and reselling these products. Jewelry is the slowest fashion of all. Nothing is wasted and everything is reused because of the sheer amount of value contained therein. Fast fashion products end up in the ground. Jewelry products start in the ground and stay out. So um, finally, we had just a couple of other points. Uh, we wanted to disallow carbon offset claims that have very tenuous connections to the actual supply chain. I think um, although carbon offsetting is great, uh, the conversation is really moving beyond that at this point. We also suggested that mining free claims may be deceptive uh, when used for fine jewelry and its materials. And then uh, finally, we encouraged alignment with international standards, although that's not something that the FTC is particularly known for caring about. Uh, we think it's really important. Uh, I'd like to thank Sibjo for signing on to the JVC comments. We also had 15 additional industry associations sign on. And it's really important for us to be able to speak as representatives of the entire industry. So it's incredible that Sibjo was able to uh, support those comments. So what's next? We wait, the FTC, those two human lawyers that I talked about have to review all 7,000 comments filed. Um, and that's a lot more than they normally get. Usually it's about a couple hundred. Uh, so they'll have to respond to those. So the response could come in either more questions or they could give us a set of draft guidelines or they might conduct additional workshops. They'll repeat that process as needed until the rules are finalized. And we hope to hear some update on the progress by the end of the year. But again, the FTC is not known for being particularly generous with sharing their timeline. That's my update. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Let's move on to IPMI. We have a presentation here. Larry. The slide. Hi, I'm Larry Drummond. I'm the executive director of the International Precious Metal Institute, which is a trade organization for the precious metal industry. I'd first like to start off by uh, thanking Dr. Uh, Gaetano uh, Cavalieri for inviting me here. To also like to uh, thank Jonathan Drodby for introducing me to Gaetano. So my role here today that uh, Gaetano requested I do is to tell you a little bit more about the IPMI and to plant some seeds in your mind on how the IPMI and the jewelry industry could collaborate more together. So the IPMI was founded in 1976. We have over 600 members worldwide. And as you see, our tagline is connecting you to the world of precious metals. So in a few words at a high level, what does that, what does that mean? So what we do for our members, we provide a landscape to connect learn and build relationships. Next slide. So we, we serve as a, a global platform for the precious metal uh, community. We host an annual international conference. Uh, we have a, a variety of committee seminars and webinars, regional international chapters, uh, publications and a monthly newsletter. And uh, one of the key things is we really create an unparalleled networking opportunity for people in the precious metal industry. Uh, our members come from 
a variety of sectors, as you can see. Uh, that's some of them on, on the screen there. What I'd like to point out on that slide is, from a jewelry perspective, is refining, recycling, laboratories, then the banking, trading, and finance. So I'll talk a little bit more about those in coming slides, but I think there's, a, uh, there's several key touch points that we can work on going forward. Okay, so we have an, uh, an annual conference, which is a four-day event. It's held every June, and we typically have about 500 people attend those, uh, those uh, conferences. Uh, again, our seminars focus more on in-depth topics. They, the seminars are, are uh, a lot more technical in nature. Um, and our committee, so we have a variety of committees. Uh, sampling and analytical committee, which has one of their uh, two meetings a, uh, a year. They're having a symposium at the Colorado School of Mines in about two weeks. And again, this is a couple of day deep dive for laboratory managers, uh, and, and it's a, another key touch point, I think, for the jewelry industry. Uh, Platinum Group Metal Refiner Committee, Security and Anti-Money Laundering, Environmental Health and Safety, Legislative and Regulatory Affairs. Uh, we just formed a, a year ago two new committees, a Sustainability ESG Committee and a Women of IPMI Committee. And as I mentioned, we have a, a couple of uh, chapters, European chapter, New England chapter, and, and a New York chapter. So on the first slide, you might have saw two logos. I should have pointed them out better, but we, we also have a foundation arm of the IPMI. So that foundation is the uh, Precious Metal Educational and Scientific Foundation. So it's really dedicated to promoting the science and technology within the precious in metal industry. And there's an awful lot of science and technology behind what goes into making uh, the base of all the jewelry that, that you turn into such beautiful products. Uh, the foundation hosts many technical sessions at the annual conference and seminars throughout the year. And produce an, an IPMI journal, which is a, a, a fairly detailed scientific journal that comes out once a year and carries out the long-standing charitable mission. So this is really serves as sort of a beacon of inspiration and opportunity for professionals and students. Attracting a new generation of students through the student award program is something that IPMI has been at for a very long time. And these are PhD students. And our awards committee chair, my good friend, uh, happens to be sitting at the dais over here, Dr. Jonathan Jodry like I say, chairs that committee and is also a board member of the foundation. And we host, honor, we honor institutional leadership through our premier awards program and hold the annual jury design awards program, which we've been doing since 1991. Next slide. You may see a familiar face here. Uh, so at our 47th annual conference this past June, our, our most prestigious award is this uh, Tanaka Award, which recognizes exceptional contribution to the precious metal industry. And this year's winner was no one other than our Dr. Gaetano Cavalieri. So please, let's congratulate him once more here again today. And most importantly, Gaetano, thank you for all the contributions you've made to the industry and continue to make. Our Henry J. Albert Award is a, uh, sponsored by VASF, and that recognizes uh, someone that's really contributed a lot to the science and technology of precious metals. And I have a typo on the, on the last award. The last award is our Carol Tyler Award, which recognizes outstanding achievement of women in the field of precious metals. And, um, a professor won it uh, this year, but someone you may know, uh, some of you may well know, uh, the 2022 winner was Ruth Crowell of the LBMA. Next slide. So the jewelry, I want to just touch a little bit on this uh, jewelry, uh, jewelry Design Awards. This is just some pictures of uh, this year's awards winner. Next slide. So our New England chapter, and the New England area uh, for IPMI is there's a cluster of, uh, of companies uh, in the greater Providence, uh, Rhode Island area. Uh, 
Metallor, where I, where I used to work, I was, I was president of Metallor for the Americas for a bunch of years, uh, is just over, the, just over the border from uh, Providence, Rhode Island, but there's a lot of companies in the jewelry industry and in the refining industry and in the precious metal financing industry, uh, all clustered in that, in that area. So anyway, one of the key things that the New England chapter does, they've been doing this annual competition since 1991, and they showcase, recognize, and, and award uh, jewelry design uh, students, and they have a number of criteria, and they've given out over $300,000 in awards to these students uh, over, the, over the years. Um, I'm not gonna go through the appendix, but in the appendix, uh, uh, for all your jewelry lovers, there's some more details about some of the uh, some of the students and the and the program it, itself. Uh, now, some of these students have gone on to uh, start their own business, but there's many that have actually gone on, and actually some still do work in Tiffany and uh, Swarovski. So, uh, so they are staying in the industry. So, I have a couple of slides on on how we may work together better. Um, when Gaetano and I talked in, uh, in Arizona at our, at our conference, uh, it was key in both our minds that the jewelry industry is sort of an underrepresented industry uh, for IPMI. And from Gaetano's point of view, he, by attending a lot, all of our sessions at the uh, conference, he thought there was a lot of value that the jewelry industry could get by being more involved with the IPMI. So that's why we want to try and work more together. So just a couple of uh, seeds to plant in your mind. Uh, so the first one, obviously, we talked about the environmental social governance. So there's, I think, uh, you know, with responsible sourcing being a key component of that, uh, as we've heard over the past few days, I think there's some work we can do together there. Next slide. Refining. Refining, I think, is another uh, key, key area. So there's, you know, there's, there's many member companies in IPMI that are involved in all the stages of, let's call it recycling, refining, until you get to the final uh, product, which is pure, you know, pure gold or pure platinum or pure palladium. Um, so a key area that we could collaborate is, is on this. So we have many of our member companies are good delivery refiners for the LBMA and the LPPM. Many can source uh, certified artisanal mined gold, like Fairmind and Swiss Better Gold and provide certified responsible source gold, such as RJC. Uh, one of those refiners is sitting at the table over there, okay? Uh, one thing I am proud of, when I was at Metal Ore um, and ran the operation that we had there, we were the first refinery in the world to get the RJC COC uh, certified uh, certification, and our, and our Swiss operation in, in Marin, Switzerland, was the second in the world to get that. So. Uh, we do have some good ties with the R RJC as well. Next slide. You know, we heard a little bit the other day about education and training. So, you know, we're, a, a lot of what the IPMI is about is providing a lot of information, uh, you know, to our members. So I think that's another area where that we can, we can work together collaboratively and, and really help benefit both the uh, professionals and in the case of jewelry, the consumers across the globe as well. In terms of market insights, at, all, at essentially every event that we have, uh, we're fortunate to have, you know, really worldwide experts in, in the precious metal uh, markets uh, as, as key members of, of the IPMI. So there's a lot of information that's, uh, that's, that's uh, presented at these events. So again, the key thing is providing people with as much relevant information as possible so that they can make better informed uh, business decisions. So my last slide is just again to, to plant some seeds on what could we do next? So one of the things we could do, and we can discuss this further, Gaetano, uh, you know, a after the Congress, is, you know, join seminars that we could put together. And uh, I think this would be great, not only from uh, exchange of information, but also great for networking. Because as I, I said in my first slide, that one of the key things is that building relationships. I think you. I can attest to it because I spent my whole life essentially in the precious metal industry is that it's, it's 
It's, you have to earn the trust, but you build the relationships after earning that trust, and that can last a lifetime in, in business. So I, I think there's a lot we can do there. And, and some maybe areas that we can consider is, it could be Arezzo or Milan, it could be somewhere in Italy or somewhere in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, those, because those, if we could have it where there's a cluster of activity, then we can have a, a better chance of attracting a lot of lo local uh, attendees as well. And also we could have, we had a jewelry session at our annual conference. We can do that again in uh, June in Orlando this year as well. So there's some things to think about. And um, next slide. So with that, I have my, uh, my contact information there. Uh, the, the slides plus the appendix will be made available to everyone, but feel free to, uh, to contact me and I can give you uh, a lot more detailed information. Thank you very much. Dr. Cavalieri, thank you very much for your very kind invitation, ladies and gentlemen. I've, I've been given strict instructions that it's 10 minutes dead, so here's my challenge. <laughs> Waiting for technology. The clock doesn't start yet. for the delay, my computer's just gone offline. We'll be getting back online shortly. <laughs> take your time, take your time, take your time. Just chat amongst yourselves for a while. Yes, please. Let's, let's okay. do it. Guys, considering that uh, I was too, I mean, not too lazy, but uh, anyway, I don't have slides. So I think I will just take five minutes over until they solve the, the problems. And, and just to give you a very quick update 
on the, on the ISO process going on the definition of recycled gold. In fact, the reason why I don't have slides is, to be honest, while an ISO drafting is in place and experts are talking together, we are not allowed to share the content of the discussions. So I just want to give you a broad overview of the, the process, uh, why and how it started. Uh, about eight months, nine months ago, ISO was approached by, no, that was, sorry, that was already 12 months ago, ISO was approached by Gaetano asking whether we could do something to solve the issues that we have currently in the industry, which is that all organizations start to have a different definition of recycled gold. Uh, we have a definition from OECD, we have another one from LBMA, we have another one for RGC, COC, and then subsequently many brands started to define recycled gold uh, in their own world and using different concepts. And ISO has two main goals, favor international trade and protect consumers. And those are two areas where this multiplicity of definition is really good for no one. So for this reason, uh, the vote took place and it was agreed to start working on that topic. And uh, you have to remember that in ISO standards, ISO standards are open, anyone can use an ISO standard. You don't need to get a certification or an accreditation to use an ISO standard. We were pretty afraid that people will use that definition of recycled gold and abuse that standard. For example, they find that that gold is recycled, but at the same time have a gold which was not responsibly sourced. So for this reason, we created a project in three parts. And the idea is that we are going to create a standard on responsible sourcing of precious metals, which will be obviously aligned with OECD regulations, OECD guidelines. And then only companies which can prove that they are uh, in line with that ISO standard will be able to use the definition of recycled gold. Uh, there, there is a lot of discussions and we have the next meeting on Friday here in Jaipur and online. There's a lot of discussions between uh, the experts and to be honest, there's also a lot of disagreement. Uh, some experts think that the ISO standard should be very largely covering what today is called recycled gold, so either using uh, CIBJO or LBMA or RGC COC gold and other experts uh, are saying that we should in, in fact stop using the word of recycled gold and uh, uh, reserve that for a very small subset of gold which is really coming from waste and we go back to the definition of waste. There is often this idea that waste is something going to trash, it's not correct. Waste is anything that arrives at its end of life and is not used anymore. Uh, it's like if you have uh, a glass, glass, you don't really throw it in, in the trash anymore, but we still consider that this is recycled. So uh, those definitions, in fact, interestingly, all those definitions in ISO framework uh, were defined post uh, the Rio conference in 1992. That's where we created to, uh, to have concept like uh, pre-consumer, post-consumer uh, materials. And now those, those concepts are being also updated to keep up with the new, the new trends. So this is a little bit where we are. The process just started three months ago. I'm hoping that by uh, next year, we are going to have a definition that uh, will be acceptable for the market. Just to be clear, what we would like to have is to have an alignment between LBMA, uh, RGC, CIBJO on one unique definition. It's not easy to do, but we all feel that if we want to have something a little bit efficient on the market, we have to be able to go toward the market with one single definition. So I hope to keep uh, all the CIBJO member up to date and uh, hopefully by next year's conference, we'll have some good results. Thank you very much. I may take the floor, meanwhile, the technical problems are solved, I hope. Uh, I would like to follow what, what you said, Jonathan, because the issue related to recycled gold and all the activities around uh, uh, the recycled gold itself are uh, impacting uh, 
the industry uh, just because there is a, a lot of confusion. Uh, the people do not understand. So when uh, ISO, the international standard organization, where CIPGEO is uh, part of as a liaison partner, uh, is important because it gives to all of us the possibility to uh, speak one language, understand what we are going to do, uh, understand the use of uh, uh, the recycled gold, because it is obviously we cannot share at the moment uh, any document uh, to this audience, not because uh, 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 we don't want, but because we have to follow rules. And this is the main principle, we have to follow rules. And the NISO, uh, uh, International Standard Organization, the rules are restricted, where the things and all the processes has to be done by the books in order that the final consumer, apart the industry itself, is uh, aware where the gold is coming from. You take the example of India, where there are uh, tons and tons and tons of recycled gold uh, that uh, is in the culture, in the tradition uh, of this country. And obviously, we need to give to the Indians' uh, uh, business people the opportunity to comply with ethical rules. And this is an extra reason why we are working not only for India, but for the rest of the world. But certainly India is one of the most important markets for that. Uh, it is essential that uh, we do this job and we go forward with that. Thank you very much. I don't know if you, did you solve the problem? You? Hello? Pronto? Did you solve the problem? Yeah. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. Please. Thank you, Gaetano. And yeah, I think it's... Just to add that, finalize, it's really important to be clear. We create a standard for the whole world. We don't create a standard for Western European jewelry companies or refiners. We have to create a final document that would be applied with the same benefits all around the world and all along the value chain of the gold. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. I again, apologize, ladies and gentlemen. If we could now turn to Doug's presentation, please. We're on. Well, thank you for your patience, Jonathan. Thank you for excellently filling in. So, my, my 10 minutes begins now. The Birmingham Assay Office is an independent certification business celebrating 250 years of operation this year. The independence of the business is set out in the original Act of Parliament of 1773 that created the business. This permanent independence by statute also provides additional assurance to our customers and their products bearing the famous anchor certification mark. That these articles have been tested and certified to comply with international standards and regulations. Our mission is to protect consumers. And this is our common and enduring bond with Sibjo. For 250 years, our business has mainly been around hallmarking of precious metals to ensure that national standards of purity are maintained. The primary driver for this has been the prevention of fraud as a means of consumer protection. There are some current hot issues within our industry, as Jonathan has just talked about which hinge around definitions of recycling and traceability. At their root, these are very similar. If you achieve full traceability, the classification of gold that has previously been refined becomes almost insignificant. Although at the heart of the debate, market value and social responsibility are more significant. However, in all three situations, we continue to ignore the focus of our mission to protect consumers by identifying the dangers within the products being sold. As jewellery accounts for 50% of annual gold production, we cannot ignore this situation. 
And Sibjo's primary mission is the protection of consumer confidence. Some 1,800 tons of, of, of gold are used in the production of jewelry on a global basis. This equates to more than 100 million articles of gold jewelry made every year. We know that within gold alloys, other elements are used for various technical and aesthetic purposes. These include the known toxic culprits of nickel, cobalt, chromium. Nickel has been identified as the leading cause of metal-induced allergic contact dermatitis, with the European surveillance system of contact allergens citing nickel-related allergies at 18% of the European population, with cobalt at 7% and chromium at 4%. In the USA, percentages are slightly lower at 14% for nickel. And whilst EU regulations stipulate maximum release thresholds for nickel, US legislation does not. California Prop 65 regulations differ from federal guidelines, stipulating that products containing nickel alloy require a warning label without the definition of any safe harbor levels. The US Federal Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act does not address or regulate potential nickel health risks. More concerning still is the growing awareness around other metals such as gold, palladium and copper, which have also been found to trigger allergic reactions in certain cases. These statistics make it clear. The issue extends beyond nickel. A comprehensive approach to examining the allergic potential of other metals is urgently needed. In the UK, Birmingham Assay Office have been pushing the Office of Product Safety and Standards to change the Hallmarking Act to include other elements of regulatory control, in addition to the traditional fraud control to further protect consumers. Sibjo has a significant role to play in supporting the drive to develop a global solution to a problem that affects so many people. In reviewing the data from the European Surveillance System of Contact Allergens, we can see that the picture across Europe with the upper graph on the left defining nickel allergy levels and the lower graph dermatitis levels. On the right hand side, we can see incidence of dermatitis across Europe. If we extrapolate this data, we can estimate that between 18 and 20% of the world population are affected at least by nickel allergy. And as we know, once sensitized to this, there is no recovery and also a, an increasing risk of sensitization to other allergens. Birmingham assay office research, underpinning the ANCASERT pro-test method, which began in 2014, identified these additional elements having the potential to trigger skin allergy in human population. Despite the regulations in the EU to protect people's health, a high number of subjects are still affected by metal-induced allergic contact dermatitis. The Ancasert Pro Research Project identified these elements as having the potential to trigger skin allergy in human populations, and the test method developed identifies all of these elements and determines the safe threshold along with regional regulatory compliance. These allergens have varying degrees of sensitization. Among them, nickel, cobalt, and chromium represented with the highest allergic occurrences. In contrast, others such as gold, palladium, etc., are new emerging allergens. They are now of growing concern amongst dermatologists for their capability under certain circumstances to cause metal-induced allergic contact dermatitis. Of particular interest today is, of course, the precious metals that for so long have been presumed to be safe. This is clearly not the case. And so whilst the phrase gold allergy may be surprising to many, as it's a metal that we often associate with luxury, value, and stability. And the declaration by the American Contact Dermatitis Society in 2001 was a great surprise to all. 
are most severely disconcerting as we've traditionally seen gold as an inert element. In other words, it's hard for gold to react and solubilize in bodily fluids like sweat and saliva. But despite its chemical stability, it appears that gold has a more reactive side when it comes into contact with human skin. In 2016, Dr. Joseph Fowler, a world-renowned dermatologist, boldly declared that gold should be considered the allergen of the decade, century, and perhaps even the millennium. This statement has made many in the medical community uncomfortable, pushing us to revisit our understanding of gold and its interactions with the human body. Now, it's a proven fact. Gold can indeed trigger allergic reactions. A significant percentage of the European population has shown symptoms of gold allergy. The impact of these allergens on society is immense. Considering that around 20% of more than 100 million articles of gold produced annually will be worn by consumers affected by allergic contact dermatitis. That's 20 million people per annum who will be impacted by allergic contact dermatitis to varying degrees. Ignoring the health risks posed by toxic elements in alloys not only compromises human safety, but also places a significant burden on healthcare systems. When allergens and sensitizations go untreated and undiagnosed due to the lack of awareness or regulation, they can escalate into more severe health conditions. These may require more intensive medical interventions, ranging from prescriptive medication to hospital admission for severe allergic reactions. And this is aside from the impact on mental health. A study published in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology estimated the direct healthcare costs related to allergic contact dermatitis to be over $1.4 billion annually in the United States. And this figure does not include indirect costs, such as losses of workdays, which can add an additional several hundred million dollars to the economic burden. In Europe, where the prevalence of nickel, chromium, and cobalt-induced allergic contact dermatitis is more than 18% of the population, the economic impact is similarly staggering. These numbers become even more distressing when considering that these statistics only represent the known cases and might not fully encapsulate the scale of the problem. SIBJO, as an international organization and its objectives must take into account the healthcare systems of developing and underdeveloped nations. In these countries, the burden of untreated or poorly managed allergic reactions can be particularly devastating as healthcare resources are already scarce. As we've seen, the issue of allergenic elements in alloys extends far beyond the traditional culprit of nickel. This calls for a holistic approach where international standards are designed to account for all elements commonly used in alloys for jewelry. This aligns well with Sibjo's mission to protect consumer confidence, worker health, and overall industry integrity. We need to implement guidelines that require testing not only for well-known allergens, but also for other emerging elements such as gold, palladium, and copper. We must advocate for clearer labeling that informs consumers about all elements present in an alloy, not just the precious metals. This aligns completely with the desire for full product traceability. We must seek to harmonize new standards with existing regulations in developed countries and promote their adoption in developing and and underdeveloped nations. The benefits of this approach are clear. From the public health perspective, we can see that with more comprehensive regulations in place, we can significantly reduce the number of people affected by metal allergies, thereby lessening the burden on healthcare systems worldwide, providing greater economic benefit to all nations. Considering fraud prevention through enhanced transparency by clearer labeling, and more exhaustive testing, we will help prevent fraud and unethical practices within the industry.
In turn, this will build greater consumer trust from a more transparent and health conscious approach, which is essential for the long term success of the jewellery industry. To quote Mr. Vipal Shah from the other day, consumer confidence must be protected at any cost. As an organisation committed to consumer protection and industry integrity, Sibjo has a pivotal role to play in pushing for these international standards. Whether it's by partnering with global agencies or influencing policy through its own recommendations, Sibjo can and should lead the way in this necessary evolution of the industry. Thank you. Thank you, Doug, for bringing that to our attention. That's obviously going to be a focus for us to look at in the coming year. Uh, we're happy to have you as part of the steering committee uh, working on that with us. We the last topic on the agenda is just um, John Mulligan is going to give us a quick update on the precious metal impact forum proposed discussion. From the floor. I understand why you don't want me on the stage, Hugh, it's okay. Um, to be honest, we've already covered it in a way because I think Jonathan has already basically defined a response to that. The, the Precious Metal Impact Forum were one of um, the precious metals uh, discussion groups who proposed an alternative definition to recycled gold. Um, as Jonathan has already stated what the defined global responses of which Sibjo is a part were feeding into that process. I don't think it's, it's that important to go into that definition anymore except to say it is out there, there are alternative discussions, sorry, alternative definitions being discussed. So I think, you, I think we've said enough. Um, when Jonathan reports back, when we report back in terms of um, our inputs into that process, I think then we'll have something more concrete to say. Thank you. If I may, from the, from the floor, so I stay seated on, uh, on this issue. I have had some comments that were brought to the attention of the chair of the ISO technical committee who is seated next to you. Uh, and I can understand that under the point of view of ISO, following the rules, everybody is uh, welcome to contribute. But still CIPJO, and I as president and responsible of CIPJO, which is a Swiss organization headquartered in Bern, Switzerland. Bern is the capital of Switzerland, by the way, just in brackets. I have requested that all these uh, different organizations, part of this big table, has to have at least the same legitimacy that Sipjo has. Because otherwise, instead to talk within the group under the banner and the flag of ISO, which I deeply respect and is essential the existence of the standard body, then maybe could create some uh, misunderstanding. <laughs> so I just want to express uh, my uh, thinking, uh, both personal and as president of CIPJO, because uh, it is uh, important that we bring forward these activities in the way that ISO prescribe. And the rules are rules, and everybody has to respect the rules. Overcome the rules up to now, is not allowed. That is not the game of democracy. Thank you. 
Thank you, Gaetano. So just to finish off on what we're going to be focusing on in the coming months, uh, we're going to be looking at edits of the Precious Metal Blue Book to include the definition of white gold. We're going to revisit Clause 6.7 on the coating of precious metal articles and look at uh, a definition of roll gold. And we're obviously going to address the issue that uh, Doug just raised. So before we close the meeting, are there any comments, requests from the floor for the commission to consider? Yes, if I may. Of course. Going back to uh, the excellent presentation that Doug did and have you had the pleasure to visit uh, the Blue Bricks building <laughs> in Birmingham. Uh, I have to express my deep appreciation and congratulation to Doug and all this management and team for the professionalism and the high level of technical uh, tools, uh, and I would say including the people because they are super experts. And I told uh, clearly to Doug that his uh, civil firm intention to work very closely with the Birmingham SA office in order to uh, bring uh, to the consumer in every single sense, including the uh, part of health because allergy and all the other stuff. Uh, and I want to thank you for uh, having been uh, uh, so uh, immediate, uh, active, more than reactive, to establish this activity and put this activity into the Commission. I truly welcome and thank you. Thank you, Gaetano. And just before I close, I'd like to again extend a thanks to Gaetano and to Steve for the support that you provide us throughout the year. Uh, we can't do this without you, so thank you very much. That brings us to the end of the meeting. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you all this evening. Come on and